Good morning, and welcome to the United States Army Medical Center of Excellence, Joint Base San Antonio, Native American Indian Heritage Month Special Observance. Today's ceremony is sponsored by the United States Army Medical Center of Excellence. Today's guest speaker is Mr. Edwin DeLuna, charter member of the National Museum of the American Indian and an active member of the San Antonio Conservation Society, as well as the president of the United San Antonio Powwow Incorporation. We're joined today by many distinguished guests, visitors, and friends. Among them are Major General General Dennis Lamaster, Interim Command Sergeant Major, Medical Center of Excellence, Sergeant Major James Musnicki, Deputy to the CG, Medical Center of Excellence, Mr. Jay Harmon, Deputy Commandant, Medical Center of Excellence, Colonel Skip Gill, 32nd Medical Brigade Commander, Colonel Wesley Anderson, 32nd Medical Brigade Command Sergeant Major, Sergeant Major Gilberto Colon, Non-Commissioned Officer Academy Commandant, Command Sergeant Major Christopher Earl. It is a great honor to have you all here today. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, please rise for the playing of the national anthem and remain standing for the invocation given by Sergeant Jim. So proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the pale ruler's pride. O'er the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming. And the rock Please play under your tradition as I play under mine. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the Lord for all the many blessings and thank you for today. I ask, Lord, you grace us with now your presence and bless this time we have gathered to celebrate the National Native American Heritage Month. Please bless the speakers and the participants as we reflect on this very important occasion. We will be a better community for com come together at this place this time for such a wonderful celebration. We are a good guy, and we thank you for this opportunity. It is in your name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, please turn your attention to the stage.
Thank you, Mr. Milo Lone Eagle Colton. We are here today to commemorate the National American Indian Heritage Event. The National American Indian Heritage Month is observed from 1 through 30 November of each year to recognize American Indians and Alaska Native cultures while educating the public about the heritage, history, art, and traditions of the American Indians and Alaska Natives. During National American Indian Heritage Month, we honor the stories and legacy to signify the strength and respect for the earth and its natural resources. Today, we pay tribute to the many American and Alaska Native Indians that have served with valor in our nation's conflicts and their many distinct and important contributions to the United States military. The theme for this year's event is Many Nations, One Fight. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce the 32nd Medical Brigade Commander for the 2020 National American Indian Heritage Observance, Colonel Wesley Anderson. How's everybody doing today? All right. Thanks to the band. Good job. Thank you. All right. And Everyone else behind the scenes to make this to make this event happen. All right. I want to thank everyone for the participation in today's events to recognize and promote National American Indian Heritage Month. The strength of our army and our nation is gained from the diversity of its people and the better understanding of each other's cultures and life experiences. I'm also pleased to see the newest members of the next greatest generation here today, our trainees. This early inculcation into the strength of diversity within the organization and nation is critical for our future success. Mr. De Luna, thank you for agreeing to be our guest speaker today. You come to us with an expansive knowledge and understanding of the American Indian and Alaska Native culture, traditions, and heritage. Along with support to the Army and community with over 25 years of service from community organizations such as Boys and Girls Club, Boy Scouts, serving on the board of directors for the San Antonio Council of Native Americans, and currently the president of the board of directors for the United San Antonio Pow Wow Inc., just to name a few. As the first inhabitants of North America, Native Americans perfected living on the land and one with nature. Many tribes domesticated edible plants, raised animals, and discovered natural medicines. Native Americans' innovations in the areas of mathematics and government greatly influenced many other cultures in Europe and Latin America. For instance, Native American governments in Eastern North America, particularly the Iroquois, served as models of federated representative democracy to Europeans and the American colonists. In fact, the current US government is based on such a system whereby power is distributed between the central authority, the federal government, and smaller political units, the states. Within our military, Native Americans have made significant contributions to our military since the Revolutionary War with 29 Native Americans earning this nation's highest honor, the Medal of Honor, with the first being awarded in 1869 to an Army Sergeant, Koru Du Chidish, from the Pawnee Tribe. In 1924, Congress granted the U.S. citizenship to Native Americans based in part for their service of some 10,000 Native Americans in World War I. In World War II, 25,000 Native Americans served. For instance, in World War II, the Navajo Code Talkers communication units worked behind enemy lines in the Pacific Theater and sent radio messages in the Navajo language, th thus avoiding the need for mechanical decoding and equipment and baffling the Japanese. From these units came several post-war tribal national Indian leaders 
such as the chairman of the Navajo Tribal Council, Peter McDonald. Currently, there are over 160,000 living veterans, which is approximately 10% of all Native Americans. 10% of all Native Americans have served this nation to protect us. And consequent to the non-Native American, that's triple, triple the non-Indian population. Again, thank you for everyone for joining us here at the Med COE today. And I look forward to hearing the remarks from our distinguished guest and speaker, Mr. Erwin J. DeLuna. Thank you, Colonel Anderson. Each year, the mayor of the city of San Antonio issues a proclamation that recognizes Joint Base San Antonio, Fort Sam Houston's National American Indian Heritage Month. And now, Sergeant First Class Melody Williams will read the San Antonio Mayor's National American Indian Heritage Month proclamation. City of San Antonio Proclamation, whereas during the month of November 2020, the Med COD, the Medical Center of Excellence, will observe National American Native Indian Heritage Month to honor the intertribal cultures and living traditions of the first people to call our land home. And whereas American Native American and Alaskan Natives have made significant contributions to the establishment and growth of the United States and have served in our nation's military to extend the blessings of liberty around the world. And whereas more than 500 tribal entities that identify the American and Native Americans' cultures continue to shape our nation by preserving the heritage of their ancestors and contributing to the rich diversity that is our country's strength. And whereas the vibrant and ancient customs of Native Americans and Alaskan Natives have played an integral part and greatly influenced the rich legacy and cultural heritage for our city. Now, therefore, I, Ron Nuremberg, Mayor of the City of San Antonio, in recognition thereof, do hereby proclaim November 2020 to be Native American Indian Heritage Month, San Antonio. Thank you, Sergeant First Class Williams. Our guest speaker today is Mr. Edwin DeLuna. Mr. Edwin J. DeLuna has two daughters, Catherine and Patricia, and five grandchildren, Stephanie, Allison, Andrew, Matthew, and Madison. He is president of the Board of Directors of the United San Antonio Pow Wow Incorporated since 1997 a Texas chartered and 501c3 organization whose purpose is to promote the traditions and culture of the American Indian. He is of Navajo and Taos Pueblo ancestry. He is a member of the Kiowa Taipa Society, Oklahoma, and a member of the Lottie Skunkamula chapter of the Native American Church of Oklahoma. Mr. DeLuna is also a life member of the National Eagle Scout Association, vigil member of the Order of the Arrow, and a life member of the Alpha Pi Omega National Service Fraternity. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our guest speaker, Mr. Edwin DeLuna.
Good morning. Uh, I appreciate the introduction, and a couple of times uh, I've been called Edwin. Not a problem, except that's my identical twin brother, and he appreciates every time he can speak before you, even if he's not here. Um, he's actually uh, in uh, Arizona and uh, does participate in Native American culture up there and does presentations as well, so we appreciate the uh, hands-on to him as well. Uh, as I said before, I'm Taos and uh, Navajo Diné uh, ancestry on my mother's side. My father's family came from Mexico. I participate in American Indian uh, dance. It's part of my culture since I was 12 years old. I have two daughters again and uh, five grandchildren. And each of those participate in the culture that we're here today celebrating. I look forward at times to, to tell people about what I know about American Indians. But I will tell you, if you take a, an illusion and look at something as an example, uh, a 55-gallon drum. Most of you have seen one of those in your military career somewhere, somehow. And if you take a drop of water and drop that in, I may know a lot, but one drop of water is all I know in that 55-gallon. There's so much out there to learn, and I encourage each of you to examine and look forward to all research material that's out there. You have to remember that the American Indian uh, history is still being written. Our, most of our history over the last few hundred years has been all oral. So much of the information that you have today sometimes has to be passed down from one person to another. And uh, fortunately, this month, uh, it's been a long time coming over the years in the United States to allow us to have a full month to try to celebrate that tradition, those cultures, those things that we have learned from our elders, those people that have come before us, and those that continue to teach and learn about the American Indian heritage and culture. We celebrate that rich culture uh, as well as traditions and histories, and to honor and recognize extraordinary achievements and important contributions of the American Indian. It also gives us an opportunity to educate uh, the general public about the American Indian and to raise general awareness about the unique challenges Native people have faced both historically and in the present day. Additionally, the ways that the American Indian has worked to conquer these challenges. Our heritage, our culture, have been passed down for hundreds of years. We've served, you've heard, in all branches of the military service in every major military conflict since the founding of this country. We celebrate you as veterans, you as active military this month as well. And it's well founded that we can go ahead and celebrate with you today. You in, he indicated earlier uh, that we have the highest percentage per capita of uh, ethnic group people that have served in the military. I come from a large family. There are 14 children in my family. Of that, we had uh, nine boys. And out of that, I have uh, one brother that served in the United States um, Navy as a medical corpsman attached to a Marine Battalion. I had two other brothers serving in the United States Navy on nuclear subs. I have an additional brother that served uh, with the United States Marine Corps and uh, retired uh, as a gunnery sergeant and we're real uh, pleased with them. My father served most of his military career at Fort Sam Houston and retired after 28 and a half years. We're a proud family that are proud of the military services that have been provided by American Indian people throughout this country and throughout the world. You heard about the code talkers from World War II with the Navajos. They by far are the largest group of Indian people that participated in uh, the conflict for World War II, but they're not the only ones. You had a group of Comanche code talkers. They numbered 14 that landed on the beaches of Normandy that with their help, not a single one of them, by the way, was ever killed in action, but with their help, helped defeat uh, the German army. Uh, well, they didn't have the formal training that Navajos had to go to a school to learn all of that, they worked among themselves because they were from the same community. And so when they were trying to figure out how to say something in Comanche, they didn't have to write it down. They 
spoke to you from one end to the other and they knew exactly what they were going to say. So there was not a, a, a word as an example for tank. So they used a turtle because it moved slow and it had a hard shell. There was no word for a bomber. So that they used a flying, a pregnant flying fish. So even if another Comanche heard it, they would try to figure out why are they talking about pregnant fishes that are flying? They didn't understand what it was, but that was instant communication from one person to another, and they were able to decipher that without having to write it down or transfer it over. So if they needed to, to move artillery or have some uh, support, they could relay it from one place to another. There were a lot of movies on that, and sometimes those things are fictionalized to kind of uh, who we are. But an interesting fact that most people don't realize is that they couldn't tell anybody after World War II what they did in the military. They all went home. They went back to their communities. And it wasn't until almost 50 years later that they were able to tell people what they did. The military thought this was such a great idea to have the Navajos out there that they told them they couldn't speak about it at all. They clearly classified because if they ever needed to use it again, it would be available. He indicated that there's an inaccurate count, I'm sure. Um, they were awarded 71 air medals, 51 silver stars, 47 uh, uh, bronze stars, 34 distinguished flying crosses, and the congressional medals they indicated. Prior to World War II, there were 16 that were awarded, and since World War II, nine. That's a lot of individuals uh, being recognized. There are 573 United States federally recognized Indian nations, tribes, bands, pueblos, and communities and native villages in the United States today. There's additional uh, state recognized tribes located throughout the United States and respected by their state governments. Not all Indian nations have been recognized by the federal government because they didn't have a treaty or compact or fight, fight with them. A classic example has to do with the La Pana Apaches here in, in Texas. Uh, they've always been here. They've never gone away. Uh, one time the state of Texas said there were no more Indians in Texas at all uh, and, and wrote that uh, as a proclamation. Uh, a few years back they uh, recognized formally that the La Pana Apache tribe of Texas is a recognized tribe. They're all American Indians and Alaska Natives are all members of the original indigenous people of North America. American Indian people existed as sovereign governments before the European settlers arrived in America. When they first encountered, the Europeans first encountered the Indians, uh, the American Indians were a power to reckon with. Not only did they, they have uh, combined uh, powers one, with one another, but they all had the strength in numbers, and also they knew where they were at and how to, to uh, determine their own ways. They recognized American Indians and, and formed treaties with them and, and set them up as sovereign nations and recognized them as such. They've already said that uh, the United States Constitution is based on the Iroquois Confederation, Confederation about how they were governed and a lot of people still don't realize that, that some people just got together and, and formed that, but there was a, a basis of where they were at. The United States continues to recognize the unique political status and relationship of American Indians. The governmental status of tribal nations is at the heart of nearly every issue that touches American Indian country. Self-government is essential for us. Uh, if the tribal communities are to continue to protect their unique culture and identities. We as American people, Indian people, have the power to govern in all matters involving our members of each tribe, as well as a range of issues in Indian country, including tribal governments, to maintain the power to determine their own governmental status. In addition, tribal governments are responsible for a broad range of governmental activities on tribal lands, including education, law enforcement, and they do have their own law enforcement departments and tribal courts, judicial systems, health care, environmental protection, natural resources, 
and management and the development of maintaining basic infrastructures such as housing, roads, bridges, sewers, public buildings, telecommunication, broadcast and electrical services, and solid waste treatment and disposal. Those aren't easy things that they've had to, to do over the years. It's taken years and years for them and they still continue to struggle. Um, they have to raise most of their own funds. Uh, not every Indian that belongs to an Indian tribe is getting government assistance through either checks or royalties or anything else. Uh, they're still uh, fighting, including through the Osages, about mineral rights for, for those individuals that have been on the rolls for, for years and uh, trying to make sure that they maintain their rights to those mineral rights that the federal government is supposed to uh, handle for us. The tribes individually determine their citizenship. They establish their uh, civil and criminal laws for their nations. They do their taxing, licensing, regulating, ability to protect the welfare of citizens within their tribal territories, and to maintain and exercise control and power uh, to exclude individuals from tribal lands. They can't say you're coming in our property, our lands, and you're not allowed to come in. And that's one of the rights they maintain. Uh, you've noticed a few months back that there was uh, some tribal people that said, we've closed our lands because of this uh, virus that we have here, and we're not allowing you to come pass through or, or stop because we're trying to control the spread. And so they, they, they had the right, and there was some legal uh, ramifications on that. When the United States uh, expanded uh, in this country, American Indians lost a lot of their tribal lands and properties. Uh, they had their own designated areas that they were aware of what they had. Uh, today in the United States, uh, because of treaties of Congress uh, and executive orders, uh, lands have been set aside and they continue to uh, operate on those lands uh, so that there's no further encroachment and little by little some of the tribes are, are obtaining new land or lands that are out there to expand their own areas. Um, there are three types of uh, reserved lands here and they're military, public, and Indian lands. Uh, I find it unique at this time that uh, at one time, the Indian reservations were where uh, we put Indian people and they couldn't get off the reservation. Uh, and the military reservations were the areas where people were free to come in and go and get protected. Today, we almost have the reverse. People go onto Indian lands uh, freely and it's difficult to get on a military installation these days. So it's kind of a reversal on some of the things that were happening. There are 56.2 million my acres, uh, million acres that are held in trust for the, by the United States for various Indian uh, tribes and individuals. There are approximately 326 Indian land areas in the United States administered as federal Indian reservations. Uh, these include uh, the reservations, pueblos, rancheras, mission, villages, and communities. The largest is 16 million acres of the Navajo Indian Nation, which are located in Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Utah. The smallest is 1.32 acres. It is a parcel in California where the Pitt River Tribe Cemetery is located. Many of the smaller reservations are smaller than 1,000 acres. Some of the reservations are remnants of the tribe's original land base. Uh, and again, not every federally recognized tribe has a reservation. In the state of Texas, we have uh, three Indian reservations, the Tiguas in El Paso, the Kickapoos in Eagle Pass, and the Alabama Cachada in Livingston. Despite only having three Indian reservations, based on the 2010 census, Texas has the fourth largest population of American Indians in the United States, and a majority of those live in Austin, Fort Worth, Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio. 
The United States Census also reports that there are 6.8 million Indians and in native population, including those more than one race. In 2017, it projected that number would increase by 10 million by 2060 and would represent 2.5% of the total population in the United States. There are approximately 29, over 29,000 American Indian and Alaska Native employer firm, firms of 20, as of 2016. Um, American Indians' occupations have included many things, including being military leaders, Vice President of the United States, United States Representatives, United States Senators, Scholars, Athletes, Olympians, Potters, Astronauts, Writers, Filmmakers, and the list goes on. Um, from over the past, we have joined with one another to support the, to change the attitudes and perceptions and fight for economic growth and environmental issues that affect all people. They continue to fight to bring the plight of the American women disappearing from their homes and families, looking to change the attitude and understanding what needs to be done to locate these women to bring closure to them back to their families. You know, they, we've talked that the American Indian uh, were made citizens by an act of Congress in 1924. An interesting fact is, though, it wasn't until 1962 that American Indians were allowed to, the right to vote in the state of New Mexico. Currently, American Indians on some Indian reservations in North Dakota are having a, to fight for their right to vote. They can't be registered because they're saying they don't have any street addresses on the reservation. Think about it. We, we take for granted. We have streets. We have numbers. We have addresses. Some of those... Uh, Indian reservations don't have a street that they live on and have numbered. They continue to fight for protection uh, and part of uh, environmental protection, part of it you heard a few years ago and still continue to do the pipelines that are going through lands that are affecting their water and their environments and continue to try to fight to make sure that those rights are protected. Um, Women are also making some strides in the Congress. There are two currently uh, American Indians, one from Kansas and one from New Mexico that are enrolled members of tribes that are serving in the United States Congress today. Despite obstacles and detours to serve this country, um, they continue to serve this country in all aspects and occupations from industry to military services. Uh, sometimes you'll hear the term uh, referring to uh, Indians as Native American, and while that is correct, when that term came into to being uh, in the 1970s, uh, when they were trying to group the Indian groups together, uh, the correct terminology, and you'll see it a lot of times, they prefer American Indian and Alaska Native. Uh, these denote cultural and historic di differences between persons belonging to indigenous tribes in the continental United States um, and tribes and villages in Alaska, uh, like the Eskimos the, uh, that are up there. Uh, they also re refer specifically to persons eligible for benefits and services funded or directly provided by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. American Indians continue to make inroads and better themselves in housing, health, education, employment, and being vocal on the needs of the communities in which they reside. Struggles are not without obstacles, but American Indians are proud people who are, want what is best for their children. Events like this happening today around the United, the United States during this month and throughout the year helps to dispel myths and stereotypes preserving stories that are often forgotten and left out of history books and present day discussions. As we make our voices heard in all areas of our communities, we will continue to grow and prosper. We look forward to uh, dialoguing with individuals and um, hope that we have taken a little bit of time today to dispel some of the stereotypes that, about American Indians and not knowing that they are uh, citizens of this world, this community, and strive to do to make this place a better place. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. DeLuna, for your inspirational words. At this time, please redirect your attention to the stage. Thank you, Mr. Colton, for that wonderful performance. Please, let's give our performer and our guest speaker another round of applause. At this time, we ask Mr. DeLuna and Mr. Colton to join us on the stage along with Colonel Anderson.
Native American Heritage Month. Your inspiring words has made this commemoration a success. Your support has amplified cultural awareness and diversity throughout our footprint. Your support in encouraging diversity, awareness across the JBSA community is greatly appreciated given this 19th day of November 2020. At this time, we ask that Mr. DeLuna and Mr. Colton please exit the stage to signify the conclusion of today's event by the traditional cutting of the cake. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the benediction given by Sergeant James and remain standing for the playing of the Army song. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's ceremony. Thank you for attending. Please join us for cake sampling located in the lobby as you exit the auditorium.